ההרצאה הזו. רק להזכירכם, פעם קודמת דיברנו על למה בעצם, למה פוריה, זאת אומרת איפה פוריה יכול להיות אופטימלי מבחינת ייצוג של סיגנל כשאנחנו מסתכלים על השגיאה, כן? זאת אומרת שאנחנו הולכים ומנסים לבחור את הבסיס הכי טוב ככה שאני קוצץ אותו, הוא ייתן לי את השגיאה הכי קטנה. עכשיו, היו בהרצאה הקודמת שתי שאלות שנשאלתי, שהן שאלות מאוד מאוד רלוונטיות ואני קצת חיפפתי בהן, ואני מעוניין, ושוב, אני לא רוצה לתת עליהן הרצאה שלמה, אבל אני כן מעוניין, מכיוון שהן עמוקות, אני כן מעוניין לתת לכם לפחות את האינטואיציה. אז השאלה הראשונה שנשאלתי, ואני לא זוכר פה בדיוק על ידי מי זה היה, אבל אתם מוזמנים להזכיר לי, הייתה הרצאה הבאה, הייתה השאלה הבאה, למה בעצם, איפה בעצם השתמשנו בעובדה שהנורמה של הפונקציות שאני מסתכל עליהן ב-L2 היא חסומה, אוקיי? עכשיו, החיפוף שלי היה בזה שאמרתי, תשמעו, בעצם אנחנו על מנת בכלל לדבר על מכפלה פנימית ושל ה... זאת אומרת, על מנת בכלל להגדיר את הנורמה של הנגזרת של הפונקציה, אני חייב שהיא תהיה חסומה ואחרי זה על מנת להשתמש, בקיצור אני צריך בעצם לבדוק מה קורה פה, זאת אומרת אני חייב להשתמש בזה. בואו נסתכל על, בואו נסתכל שנייה אחת, תדמיינו בנפשכם שפסאי הוא וקטור שנמצא בצורה הזאת, כן? והגרדיאנט של פסאי הוא איזשהו אופרטור, מטריצה לצורך העניין, אבל תחשבו על זה אפילו סתם בתור נגזרת שאני יכול לכתוב אותה בצורה הזאת. אז למעשה מה שכתוב לי, הנורמה הזאת שכתובה לי פה היא למעשה לא אחרת מאשר הגרדיאנט של פסאי שבעצם מטריצה, ש... מטריצה שעובדת על וקטור נותנת לי לא אחר מאשר וקטור בואו נאמר טרנספורס שעובדת על, שעושה מכפלה פנימית עם, עם הגרדיאנט של פסאי אורון? כן אנגלית בבקשה או, oh, סורי, סורי um, This was a bad habit So Uh, last time I was asked two questions. One of them was why should we actually, uh, why did we use the fact that the norm of the gradient is bounded? And the other one was uh, who tells me that the spectrum is discrete? I mean, why isn't the spectrum continuous? Uh, I said that I'm not going to uh, formally prove these two issues, but I would like to give you an intuition. Now, as, as, as uh, for the second question, I asked all of my excellent students, including the OTAs, and all of them had very uh, good explanations of how to explain it. However, I would like to, I mean, I prefer not to get into function analysis and prove it for the most general case, so I will, so I will only prove it for periodic functions. As for the first one, saying that the gradient is bounded, I can think of the gradient as an operator. If you think of Psi as a vector, so Psi is a vector that is getting its values, this is the first one, the second one, et cetera, et cetera, or you can think about it as a way of representing the function in this kind of vertical way. Then the gradient would be nothing but a huge matrix or a continuous operator that you can think of. Okay, usually if I'm, for example, using the forward approximation, it would be uh, minus one, one. This is how the operator looks like, okay? But in the continuous case, you can think about it as an operator that is acting on a function. Then the inner product, uh, bounding the inner product of the gradient, uh, I may write it like that, okay? So if this would be the gradient operator and this would be the function psi, this is how the inner product would look like. At the end, it would give me a scalar, okay? It would give me something that belongs to R, if the function is real. So how can I uh, continue with that? And, and I, I told you that this is bounded by one. Uh, so I can use the transpose operator in order to write it like that, okay, which I know is bounded. Now, what is this operator? What is the uh, gradient transpose operating on the gradient? Anyone has any idea? The Laplacian. Exactly. Who's minus the Laplacian. It's minus the Laplacian, the Laplacian Barak, thank you. Uh, so this would be nothing but the Laplacian. So in fact, what I've written here is nothing but uh, a way of showing that the Laplacian operating on the function in a product that with the function itself is bounded. Now, when you see something like that, you can start asking the question, okay, what can I say about this operator? I mean, how can I diagonalize it, et cetera, et cetera. 
So now let's move to the second question. Who says that the uh, spectrum of the Laplacian is indeed discrete? And for that, I will consider only uh, periodic functions, okay? So let's think of the, um, how can I get a clean image? Well, um, so this is, this is lecture number seven. Um, assume that my function psi is defined over a period and without loss of generality, I can define this period to be defined between zero and one. And assume that this, this function behaves whatever way I'd like it to behave, but it is periodic. I mean, this point and this point are identical. They have the same value. Now, everything I'm saying right now would also be valid for all functions that have um, nice boundary condition, Dirichlet or Neumann, and you don't need to know about it right now. But let's, for the sake of this argument, assume that these two functions are, uh, that I'm dealing with all the periodic functions, okay? And now the question is, um, how can I represent this set of functions whose, uh, Lapla whose, grad whose Laplacian is bounded? Let's go and try to diagonalize the uh, second order derivative. Okay, we used to call this guy T, in a moment we'll call it X. Uh, and let's ask what would be the second order derivative of T. I mean, what kind of functions can I put here Along the i, and let's for the time being assume that the spectrum is also smooth. Okay, so this is the uh, these are the eigenfunctions, and if you like, the spectrum that would diagonal diagonalize this uh, this operator. Now we all know that if you are searching for all functions whose second derivative would be equivalent to the uh, uh, to the function itself up to a up to a constant. Uh, what we need to do is resort to which functions? The harmonics, the sines and the cosines. So what I know is that I have to put here something, sine or cosine, okay? So it would be sine of uh, something times t. And obviously when I'm taking the second derivative with respect to uh, t, uh, I would get some constant, uh, some other constant. So if this is C1, I have another constant times the sine, okay? And here I have the, so it would be a different constant times C1 T. So I know that the second order derivative would always uh, give me, uh, bring it back to itself. Either it would be the cosines uh, or the sines. These are the only um, uh, functions that I would be allowed to use in order to have this kind of equation. And now the question is, what do the periodic assumption gives me? I mean, where do I, where can I use it in order to define my uh, my basis? Okay, so remember that I told you that uh, you can put here any sine or cosine, and assume for a moment that the sign is not. And and my claim is that the only uh, harmonics that would fit into a periodic sequence would be the periodic ones. I mean, I would have to have my um, arithmetic my, my geometric function end exactly at one when the cycle ends. Otherwise, uh, these two guys would never uh, meet each other. And indeed, the only way to uh, have these functions meet at the boundary point would be, uh, for the cosines and the sines, would be to have lambda as constant. I mean, what I would have to do here is have two pi kt. I mean, I would have to have a, uh, a k as a real, as, a, as an integer number. Otherwise, uh, my harmonics would not be, uh, would not be uh, periodic, okay? So this would be the only way. So one period, two periods, et cetera, et cetera. But it would always have to be an integer number of periods between zero and one. And obviously if I would like it also to hold uh, for the cosines, um, I'm doomed to uh, have always a fixed number of periods between zero and one. Now, uh, there is a, a small issue here, uh, which is really important philosophically. So I hope that I've convinced you that uh, the spectrum, the eigenvalues is a discrete set 
Obviously, it can go to infinity. I mean, I can have as many frequencies as I want, but if I would like to, to uh, uh, represent periodic functions, period, periodic size, then the only way to do that is, I mean, the only um, uh, way to have these um, uh, periods uh, in between zero and one would be to have a discrete, a discrete set of, uh, of, uh, of uh, spectrum, okay? So T cannot be arbitrary here. It should be, it should, it should, has, it should somehow link to K. And as I said, as I told, as I told you, K, K could obviously go to infinity. I mean, uh, this would be the asymptotic way of representing these small functions. Now, as I promised you, there is a really nice theoretical relation between what, what I've just described and uh, the fact that if, uh, that if I look at all peri periodic functions, so if I have any function which is periodic, oops, this is not what I expected to happen. So this is the function and then it, re it repeats itself, et cetera, et cetera. So periodic functions would always inflect if I would now look at the uh, Fourier coefficients, or if I would uh, write this uh, lambda as my uh, as, as a function of uh, of i. Okay, so I could have written lambda as a function of, for example, one over t, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, it means that if lambda in the non-continue in the non-periodic case would have been a smooth function, which would have been the Fourier transform of my function then the periodicity infects, uh, uh, um, forces this function to be periodic. And if I'm talking about real functions, it should not only, only be periodic, it is also symmetric as we have seen before, or anti-symmetric if you're talking about either the complex part, the imaginary part or the real part. So uh, I hope that I've been able to convince you that at least for periodic functions, uh, my spectrum is discrete. So periodicity, sorry, periodic means discrete uh, lambda. So I have lambda k, okay? So here I have lambda k's. So lambda would be discrete. Uh, and as I promised you, this is valid for any domain uh, it is also valid for domains where you have other boundary conditions, not necessarily periodic, but either uh, identification of the, gradi of the um, uh, gradients or identifications of the uh, values at the boundary, or obviously zeroing of the, of the uh, values at the boundary. If all the values zero at the boundary, you can think about it as, a, as periodic because uh, you can think of some uh, infinite ball that is connecting all the boundaries into a point uh, where all the values should be the same. So philosophically, it's all the same. But this is an important point that I, I, I uh, hope I was able to uh, convince you uh, is behind what we are playing with in this, uh, uh, in this, in this game. Okay, so now uh, we are ready to tackle uh, something else. And uh, well, we'll go into, uh, this is um, comic relief, which is how you should uh, sample, um, how you should sample points in any dimension if, if, you, uh, uh, if you would like to have the sampling optimal. But before that, let us, let us keep our discussion with functions. And I hope that in the recitations, uh, uh, they talked about functional maps, have they? Uh, did, uh, did, uh, Not did, yet. did Tom talk to you about functional maps? Not yet. Not yet. So it's good that I will talk about it first. So functional maps, as I told you, you have two domains. One of them, let's call it X rather than T. And the other, the other one, let's call it X tilde. And here you have a function. Okay, let's denote this function as such. And here you have the same function. I mean, it, it's getting the same values, but someone uh, squeezed and shrunk uh, the X axis so that it looks different. So for each and every value here, you have a corresponding value there, and it is also uh, ordered in the same order, okay? But somebody was playing with the x-axis. And now the question, um, now the game here is different. In, in, in the future, what we will see is that when we are getting such a function, 
uh, let's call this one psi and that one I don't know in the moment we'll see how we call it uh, then usually the game is how should we uh, reconstruct psi from some distortion that it went through here the game is different here I would like to look at my size and somehow reconstruct the X tilde as a function of X. I mean, I would like to observe the distortion. Where is it important? Where, where is it really important to do that? Let's think, for example, about stereo vision. Okay, in stereo vision, I have the left eye and the right eye both looking at some object. And in Hebrew, object is called etzem. So I will uh, denote it as a bone here. And what happens is that if I'm looking at the point, then it would be projected. I'm connecting the point with the focal point of the first image and with the focal point of the second image. And you can see that um, each one appears in, different in a different location on these images. Let's call the first one X and the other one X tilde. And now let's pick a different point, that one. And you can see that it has, that it is projected on, at a different point. And in this specific case, if I have a Rentgen view, uh, you can actually even see that the order of these uh, points was uh, changed. But let's assume for a moment that for this discussion, the order would not change. I mean, it would always be in the same order. So in stereo vision, I somehow, in order to be able to do the back projection and reconstruct back the object from its two images, this is called the shape from stereo problem. then I need to somehow look at the two functions, the two images. So the image is a function that is uh, given to me on X and X tilde and reconstruct back the original, uh, not the original, the surface, the geometry of the object that I'm looking at. And this is a non-trivial problem. Uh, why? Because uh, the human brain is really busy all the time uh, looking at the projection of the left and the right and somehow using some prior knowledge in order to decipher how the geometry of the world lo looks like. For example, when we pour water into a cup, we know exactly how is, what is the distance of the cup from the, uh, from the jar, from the, um, uh, from the bottle that we are using. Uh, and if you, for example, shut one eye, you will have a problem evaluating this distance. So this was sort of a motivation of why it is important to know if X are, and X tilde are related somehow and how they are related. Um, okay, so this was the shape from stereo. And uh, let me give you another example. Uh, if you look at two surfaces, okay, I have a surface that looks like that. So this is called, let's call this one uh, S. And I have another surface that looks like that. And you know, we know that from an intrinsic point of view, let's call this one Q. And we know that from an intrinsic point of view, uh, these two surfaces are the same. I mean, from the point of view of a small insect or an ant that would like to travel on the skin from the thumb to the pinky, uh, it would have to go probably through the same journey when it's going uh, between, when, when it's uh, doing its travel between the two uh, surfaces. So, if, for example, I have a function, which is, let's call it a thumb detector. So it would get high values here and small values elsewhere, okay? And this, the same thumb detector would get similar values here and uh, on S and on Q. But X, if I'm looking at, at my uh, domain here and the domain there are different. They are embedded differently in 3D space. I mean, although it is the same surface or from the point of view of an insect, it's a very similar surface. I don't know how to match between them. But some genie is giving me uh, this kind of a psi function that would tell me how a thumb, uh, I mean, some rough estimation of uh, a thumb indicator function that I could use. So what we would do is look at the Laplace operator here and we'll look at the Laplace operator there. In fact, it has really nice uh, way of uh, writing it. It's called the Laplace Beltrami operator and we put S and Q here and we decompose them into the relevant Fourier and we project this function onto the Fourier that is being, uh, we have a beta here and a gamma there and we'll uh, try to project uh, this thumb detector onto the eigenfunctions here 
and the thumb detector function here into uh, some other functions there. And what we would like to see is that the coefficients of the projections here and the projections there uh, align somehow. I mean, we would like to know what would be the alignment between these two functions, between these two coefficients. So this was a motivation of why should we look at this kind of, uh, of a problem, but let's simplify it. Let's uh, go back to our, um, uh, to what we already know. We have a one-dimensional function and we have uh, a one-dimensional axis. So we have psi of x and over here we'll have another one and let's see how the coefficients of these two functions are related. Okay, so we have our psi of x uh, that is a mapping between zero and one to the real number numbers. And let us have a, an orthogonal uh, basis uh, over this function. Now this basis obviously should be infinite. And for example, it can be obtained by decomposing the Laplacian. We already sh sh uh, showed that it is optimal uh, for reconstructing uh, smooth functions. Uh, so saying that it is autonomal, what I know is that the inner product of the two functions, if I have two different functions, should be zero. And if it's the same function, it, it should be one, and this is how the delta is defined. So it is one if i is equal to j, and obviously zero else. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so this is what we have here. Now, how do we project psi uh, onto this basis? What we need to do is take psi and project it onto, the, uh, onto, the, onto our basis. Obviously, it should be only in the domain between zero and one that, that we call omega. Uh, and, and we call this part, we'll call it beta i. Okay, so these are the coefficients. We used to define it as such, but let's call it beta i. Okay, and now, if we have chosen our basis wisely, what we can say is that we can truncate it after a while, and then uh, we hope that the error would be small. I mean, if we are dealing with, with smooth functions and we have chosen the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, then uh, hopefully uh, we can more or less settle with, I don't know, not uh, millions of uh, basis functions, but other, I don't know, 30, 300 or something like that. Okay, so this is the game, and, and, and until now, I just dealt with x. Now, let's move to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to our friend, which is x tilde, uh, which is defined over omega tilde. So this was x, x was between zero and one, and so this was my function psi, that was defined on x. Okay. This was x, it was between zero and one. And at the other end, I have my psi tilde, which is defined on x tilde. And x tilde is no longer uh, defined over x, but rather it's, it's defined between a and b, okay? It doesn't have to uh, be, uh, the length doesn't have to be the same. Okay, and I also know that there is some transformation that is relating uh, x and x uh, tilde, okay? So there is some, uh, monotonic transformation between x and x tilde, and I would like to extract this transformation, okay? So um, uh, psi tilde is again, is a mapping between omega tilde, which is the interval between uh, a and b. Um, and, and the question is, how can we reconstruct t? I mean, how can we, um, how can we extract t? First of all, let's assume that uh, t is known, okay? Let's assume that t is known, and at the end of the day, what I will show is that we can uh, reconstruct, uh, reconstruct it back. Now, on omega tilde, here I have my betas, beta i's. On omega tilde, I have another set of functions which we call gamma tilde, okay? So I have gamma tilde of x tilde. These are my um, orthonormal basis on uh, uh, omega tilde. Um, okay, and the coefficients by which I represent uh, gamma tilde of x tilde on that guy is equal to nothing but here instead of uh, b, I will uh, call these guys uh, gamma i. So these would be the coefficients, which would be nothing but the inner product between, uh, between um, uh, psi tilde of x tilde and gamma tilde i of x tilde, okay? 
So this is the inner product, and this would be equivalent to my GIs. Okay, now let us do the following trick. Let's take just the basis. Now, the beta i of x are functions. Uh, everybody agree with me. They are functions, they are defined uh, on x, they are defined between zero and one. Let's first of all try to translate them from x uh, to x tilde. Okay, so what I'm doing is just writing my betas uh, in the new domain uh, x tilde. How would it look like? Assume that I know the value of beta at each and every point uh, in, in, uh, in x tilde, so it would be nothing but the inner product of my betas onto the gammas times the gammas. Okay, so this is representing beta uh, as a new function on the, on, the, um, on the other domain. Let me try to uh, show you how it would look like. So I have my two sides, uh, and here I have, for example, a sign. Okay, so this is, for example, beta one, and I would like of x, and I have my stretch domain here, so this was x, and here I have x tilde. So my uh, beta one would look, for example, like something like that. Okay, so this would be my uh, beta tilde one. Now, how do the um, gammas look like on the x tilde domain? They would look like that. Okay, so this is gamma tilde of x tilde one. So obviously the inner product between the two uh, would not be zero. I mean, they would not be orthogonal to one another. So it would be meaningful uh, to have this expression. And let's call the uh, inner product between beta tilde and gamma tilde, let's call it Cij. Okay, we had G, we had, uh, we had B, and now we have C. So CIJ is nothing but taking the coordinates X tilde. Okay, I'm taking this coordinate. I'm translating it using T, using T into this point. So I know exactly to which point in beta I'm, land, I'm, I'm landing on. So this would be T minus one of X tilde. And uh, what I'm doing is that I'm, since I have this value here that I can relate to and the X tilde coordinate, I can take the inner product with gamma J of X tilde, okay? And I'm doing this inner product in the uh, omega tilde domain. Okay, the gamma so I have my functions in, in, in the left part. And I have my other function on the right part, and I have t that is relating between them. And now I can actually translate this, these eigenfunctions onto the right and use the eigenfunctions of the right in, in order to represent them. And the coefficients of representing them are Cij. Now, the magic here is that Cij do not depend on the function psi that I was using here. Okay, it is completely independent of whatever psi of x I was using. Cijs would always be the same coefficients of translating the beta functions into the gamma functions, okay? They only depend on how X is being squeezed and stretched into X tilde, okay? So this slide now looks not noisy enough in order for me to move to the next slide. So this is what this I is question. Do. Yeah, sure. So the gamma eyes on the right, they look like the beta eyes because you draw it like not squeezed, right? Like the, the blue lambda one. Eyes, the lambda eyes on the right, they look as betas uh, on the left, but uh, uh, remember uh, the, um, the gamma is, is different. The gammas are the eigenfunctions in the X tilde domain. When I'm taking the beta, Okay, when I'm taking the beta onto the X tilde domain, it will no, it would no longer be orthogonal. Okay, it would be some weird function which is a squeezing and stretching of the sinusoid, uh, but it would no longer be uh, a sinusoid here. Okay, it would not be an harmonic function, and the gamma on X tilde, for example, could be harmonic function. I mean, they could be hard. They could be. Uh, well, Shadama, they could be whatever else you'd like, but they should be orthogonal on, on X tilde. So gamma are orthogonal on X tilde, betas are orthogonal on X, and the way to communicate between them is to take the betas into X tilde. We can do that if we know T, 
and uh, represent the beta, a specific beta, uh, as my gammas. And what I'm saying is that there is no relation whatsoever in which function I'm using. The translation between the eigenfunctions is independent of the function itself. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, Ron, I, yeah. I have a question too. Um, so if I understand correctly, the, the T is uh, arbitrary. It is the, T, uh, the T is arbitrary up to the, up to the uh, condition that it wouldn't change the order of events. I mean, if I'm traveling here along the X uh, in a specific order between points, then uh, on the X tilde, it would be the same order of points, but they can stretch and, and uh, squeeze a little bit. Let me uh, yeah. show you, assume that somebody is, um, is sampling X uniformly. Okay, so this is my X axis and somebody sampled it uniformly. And now I'm looking at X tilde. So this would be X1, X2, et cetera, et cetera. So if I would look at uh, X tilde, then the T would take these samples into uh, tightly uh, samples here and here they could be uh, uh, sparse. I mean, they could be further. So the order X1 and X2 would not change, but the, uh, the distance, the, diff the uh, spacings between the points would change by T, okay? So this is, this is if I would plot T, so if this is uh, X and this is X tilde, then this should be some monotonic function uh, taking each point in X and transmitting into a point in X tilde. And T is my unknown, but for the time being, I assume that it is known. So it can take every point in X and uh, push it into uh, X tilde, or T minus one can take every point in uh, X tilde and push it back into X. But okay, so don't this... we want to uh, normalize it with the Jacobian so it will be a uh independent of the of course you do i would like to know the jacobian oh. i would like to know the jacobian but nobody is giving me the jacobian i mean i would be really the jacobian is basically how these uh, two points are being as, as i take it to an infinitesimal uh, uh, distance apart how does it change into here then obviously yeah the jacobian would be nothing but the derivative of t but i don't know t I mean, for the time being, I assume that I know it, but in a moment you'll see that I can, uh, in fact, extract the Jacobian. The Jacobian, if you do the Jacobian, Jacobian transpose is called the, the metric, but this is something that, that I would really like to know. I would like to know how X is being translated into X tilde and the Jacobian captures it, but let's, let's uh, put the Jacobian in a drawer for a moment and, and uh, uh, not, uh, not mention it. Okay, so T is what I'm after. More questions? Okay, so now let's see uh, how can I represent x tilde on uh, uh, um, psi tilde as a function of x tilde as a function of my betas, okay? So I know that x tilde can be, so x tilde was, uh, psi tilde was here. This is my psi tilde of x tilde. And I know that there is a way of translating between x and on the uh, left part I have my uh, x, so I know how to translate between my x tilde and my x, and this is my psi of x. So what I can do is if I somehow use only the x tilde coordinates, I can use the representation of psi as a function of beta and then translate it using my betas uh, uh, onto, the x -tilde, uh, onto the x tilde axis. So I basically write here, uh, beta, uh, B, we write it as bi times, okay, it's written here, times uh, my betas, but now my betas would be my betas translated onto the x tilde domain, so it would be beta i when I translate it somehow uh, with t into the beta domain, so in fact I can write it as such, as beta tilde of i and the coefficients here are nothing but b of i, okay? I've done nothing but writing the values of psi tilde as the corresponding values of psi. And the only thing I did is uh, in the eigen functions 
uh, that not the eigenfunctions, the basis, I translated x by x tilde because I know t. Okay, so this is something that I can do if I know t. So this is knowing, knowing t, and obviously knowing t minus one. Now, beta, we already saw how to write. We can write beta as my coefficients of projecting betas onto gammas in the x tilde uh, domain times the eigenfunctions on the, uh, times the basis on the uh, x tilde domain. So I can write it as such. Now what I can do is I can switch the order of my integration of my summation. And what I have in the middle is something, okay, it's a scalar that would multiply my eigenfunctions, my gamma functions on the x tilde domain. Now this something is nothing but the GIs, okay? It's nothing but the projection of the uh, psi tilde functions onto the gamma j functions, onto the gamma j functions. So in fact, what I have here is that the relation between the BIs and the GIs is given by the matrix CIJ. So in fact, what I can do is say that G, I mean, if I would look at G1, G2, et cetera, et cetera, these are the eigenfunctions of projecting psi tilde onto gamma functions is equal to my C tilde matrix that would multiply my bi coordinates. So here I would have b1, b2, okay? So this would be my CIJ matrix. And in fact, it would not depend on any psi functions I'm choosing, the relation between my Gs and my Bs would be this function, would be this, um, uh, this um, matrix. And this, this matrix is known as the functional map matrix. Uh, and this phenomena was actually known, but it was used to uh, analyze non-rigid shapes by a group at Stanford. At the time, Irela Benchen, a professor in our department, uh, was part of the group that actually introduced this idea. And I think this idea is interesting. And this is why I'm presenting it. Uh, and all the credit belongs to uh, Mirella. Uh, it was uh, Leo Gibas, uh, Mirella Benchen, in fact, uh, uh, Justin Solomon, uh, Max Osianikov. Uh, each, I think that most of the uh, authors of, these, uh, of this paper got uh, positions in excellent places. Justin Solomon in MIT, Max Osianikov in Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Uh, Gibas already had a position at Stanford, so probably, uh, uh, and they kept him. And, and uh, Mirella got a position at the Technion. So this idea uh, is, is in a sense fundamental, not because of the positions, but because I think it is important. So um, what we have here is, um, is a way of translating the BIs into the GIs. And the idea is just using this inner product between the BIs translated onto the X tilde domain uh, uh, in, by, by these uh, eigenfunctions, gamma i's uh, in the X tilde domains. But, but for, for computing the CIJ, we must know T. So T should be known. So this is nice, but uh, remember that I told you that I'm interested in T. I would like to know how this uh, transition works. And the question is, can we somehow know that? I mean, can we, from the knowledge that there is this nice linear relation between the coefficients, somehow extract T, the transformation between the domains? And the idea is that if somebody, for example, would have given me a delta function here, okay? So this would be uh, a delta function at T, at, at X zero, okay? This is the X and will tell me, look, this is how the x, the delta function uh, was translated, then I know that this would be the translation of x zero, okay? And then if somebody would move uh, the delta function into a different location, then I know that uh, if this uh, delta function moved into this location, then, then I know how to map x to x tilde. But usually I'm not so uh, lucky. Nobody is giving me a way of just traveling with the delta from the x into the x tilde. But some, that's, but some, I mean, in some occasions, I can get something that would look like 
something that I can say something about. For example, we mentioned a thumb detector or a rough estimation of uh, something I'm looking at. For example, if I have this smooth functions here, then I know that this smooth function would probably be uh, related to this function here, okay? So assume that somebody is giving me, is giving me a set of functions, psi one of x, psi two of x, and these are feature functions, okay? These are, for example, finger detection functions. So this would be the thumb, another finger, et cetera, et cetera. So projecting psi onto my, uh, onto my uh, eigenfunctions betas, I would get a set of bi's. Okay, so let's call it B, the vector. This would be a vector and let's call this vector B1. And projecting these sides onto the betas, I would get another, uh, another set of betas. Let's call this set of betas B2. And I would have B3, et cetera, et cetera. And each of these vectors of coefficients would correspond to a different set of coefficients. Here I would have G1 that would correspond to the first finger. And I would have G2 that would correspond to the second finger etc etc so what i need to do is pack all these betas together and all these g together and say that the same matrix c should translate all these g1s into these b1s and all these g2s onto these b2s etc 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 okay so if i have a lot of feature functions that we call size, then now we can extract the C that is relating between the, uh, the coefficients. And this C is nothing but T because given C, I can somehow extract T. I mean, I know how to extract T. So again, since from T we can compute C, then from C we can approximate since, since C at the end of the day would be uh, a truncated basis, I could somehow approximate T. And I can do that by using these feature functions, psi one, psi two, et cetera, et cetera. And they're, they're corresponding uh, psi tilde one of X tilde and psi tilde two of uh, X tilde, et cetera, et cetera. Let me give you a function that would immediately solve the problem. Okay? But this is the function that I would uh, most often uh, I mean, I would never get. So assume that somebody is telling me, look, uh, this is your X domain. This is your X domain. And I'm giving you a function that is going up linearly. Okay. If somebody is giving me such a function and the corresponding function over there. Okay, so this would be, then I know immediately how X is being mapped to X tilde because each value here has a value there and I know exactly how they would be mapped, okay? So I know exactly for each value here, what would be the value there, and I have a mapping between X and X tilde. So the feature functions are usually not functions like that, but there are other functions, I mean, worse in a sense, and uh, projecting them onto the eigenfunctions, not eigenfunctions, a uh, basis here, and the corresponding basis there, I can extract a way of translating between these two domains. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is exactly what we said before. If I have a delta function, then I mean, if for example, X and Y and, and X tilde would have been exactly the same, then the CIJ would be nothing but uh, the, an end that would have chosen the Fourier here and the Fourier there then the CIJ would have been nothing but delta IJ, okay? Uh, and this would, be, would have been the, the simplest case. Um, in the other cases, uh, we have a function which we call the feature function uh, that I can decompose in beta into beta i's and I can decompose in, in X tilde uh, into gamma i's, uh, GIJ's, and therefore the, um, uh, the G's and the b's are related by my function c. And if I have enough functions like that, then I can accumulate many vectors here and many vectors there and solve for c. So c would be nothing but my uh, g matrix. Now it would be a matrix divided by my p matrix. Okay. 
Oh, I see that here I checked if uh, uh, the um, good nodes can actually accept uh, um, images and it can. And this is the, uh, these are the authors of the paper. Um, so Mirella Benchen is a faculty in our department, Justin Solomon now in MIT, Ostianikov is in the Corporate Technique in France, in Paris, uh, Gibas at Stanford and Butcher, I don't know where he is. Um, okay. Now, before we go into operations, let me uh, give an intermezzo, a comic relief. And this is, let me see how we can go back. And this is the following idea. So again, before that, any questions about functional maps? It's a tricky issue because until now we had our uh, X axis fixed and now I'm giving you two X axis. So the whole philosophy becomes a little bit more complicated. And before that we had just the one uh, set of functions that is defined on X. And now I've introduced you another set of functions that is defined also in X uh, tilde. And now they are talking to one another so I understand that the conceptual jump, the philosophical jump between having only one domain and two domains is not trivial, but still, since you are now coming with an open mind, I would like you to understand that uh, when you have two different domains, they can have two different eigenspaces and you need to somehow link between them. Those of you that would like to get into shape analysis, it would be really important for you. And those of you that would like to even do signal analysis, and uh, deal with uh, domains that are seemingly unrelated. Uh, if you know something about the relation that you, uh, something about uh, corresponding feature functions, then you would have you would have a way of correlating between them using this way. This is correlation right. in the spectral domain. The feature functions need to be uh, an orthogonal uh, basis, well, or uh, uh, as we constructed it here. Then yes but you can also do with non-orthonormal basis functions. Not basis, but not orthonormal functions as well. But you have to work a little bit harder. It, is, it would not be as simple as what I've shown now. By the way, if somebody is giving you a non-orthonormal basis, you can always orthogonal. I mean, you can also, there is a simple procedure by which you can uh, make it orthonormal. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, so now the problem is a little bit different. Uh, assume, now this is again, uh, this is a really cute and nice uh, idea of how to cluster and quantize a set of points in any dimension, in any domain, assuming that you can measure distances between points. So somebody is giving you a set of points, exactly as we did in the beginning. And he's telling you, that you need to quantize the set of points into, for example, uh, three points. And they should uh, optimize a measure. So you have three candidates and you'd like to somehow uh, sample the, um, uh, the domain, the, the set of points that was given, given to you at the beginning, so that the maximal distant, distance from a representative point to a point in, it, in his uh, domain would be as small as possible. So in a sense, it's a min-max sense, okay? Now, now, generally speaking, this problem is really, really, really hard. And the question is, can we approximate it and get some almost optimal or somehow bound the optimality of what we can get? And the answer is that with a very simple uh, sampling methodology, we can do that. Um, and the answer is actually giving to you, given to you here uh, in the title. What we do is, uh, let me just give you the algorithm. First of all, pick up one point by random. Let's assume that we pick up that point. And now we measure the distance from this point to the rest of the points in the domain. And from all points that I've measured the distance to, I mean, it, would, it should be all the points. I'm picking up the one which has the largest distance, probably this one. So if this was point number one, this would be point number two. And you understand how, to, uh, how this process is going. Now I have the distance from point number two to all the points, and I'm measuring the distance from point number two to all the points. 
and I, I'm picking the one for which the distance is the largest. And, and I'm uh, not distinguishing between the distance from the first and the second. And it would be probably this one, okay? So this would be the point number three, and it would have the largest distance from both points. In a moment, we'll uh, prove it formally. And uh, this furthest point sampling strategy will prove, would give you a solution, which would be at worst, twice as bad as the optimal solution. So the distance between a point, let's think about, for example, let's examine, for example, this point or that point, from its representative, so this one would be uh, represented by point number one, and this one would be represented uh, from point number three, would be at worst twice as bad as uh, it would have been from the optimal candidate, which, which would have been, for example, these points. Okay, so this distance would have been at least twice as bad uh, as that distance. And this one would have been at worst twice as bad as this distance. And two optimality, I mean, two approximation is considered to be good. I mean, you can have some guarantee on, on how bad you are doing, okay? Um, so let's make everything formal. Let's uh, uh, consider our points X uh, to be capital X. So this would be, I have N points. Uh, this would be X1, X2. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, and it is defined as Xn. And now from Xn, and, and, and somebody is also giving me a distance function by which I can uh, define the distance between uh, Xi and Xj, and obviously this distance should be symmetric. I mean, if I fit uh, Xi and Xi, the distance should be zero, uh, and all the nice properties of uh, distance functions, although, um, I mean, let's assume that this is a distance from now, okay? And now um, the game goes like that. I'm allowed to pick up K candidates, let's call them YK, such that K is much smaller than N. And for the time being, assume that YK also belongs to XN, okay? And I would like to minimize the distortion of, so I'm picking, let's add, add some more X's here. So I had, I'm adding some more points. So I had a lot of, I have a lot of uh, X points. And now my Y's should be just a subset of X's. Let's assume that that point and that point. And in this case, K, which is equal to only two is much larger than N, which is equal to, I don't know, 20 here. And what I would like to have is that Rk, which is defined as the error, as the distance of, for each and every point x, I'm looking for yj, for which the distance from xi to yj is the smallest. So let's do that. Let's visit, for example, this point. Let's this be my xi. I'm looking among all possible blue points and picking up the one for which the distance is the smallest. So this is the distance from uh, that y, and this is the distance from that y. So obviously I would pick this guy to be my yi, to be my representative, okay? So among all points that belong to the blue, to the uh, to yk, I'm picking up uh, the one that that um, uh, for, for which the distance uh, is, the, is the smallest, okay? So I'm doing it for, I'm doing that for all, for all the X i's, for all the X i's. So each one is getting a point which would be its representative. So this, this one uh, would choose this one, uh, this one will probably choose this one, this one will probably choose this one, et cetera, et cetera. Now, among all possible XIs and all possible distance to the representative YIs, I'm picking the maximum, okay? So this would be my distortion of picking up the YIs. And I would like to optimize my Ys so that R would be minimized. So again, uh, RK is the error, is the distortion 
at my kth iteration, at picking up my uh, kth candidate uh, from the uh, from the um, uh, endpoints that I have, and I would like to optimize that. I would like to minimize R k. Okay. Okay, so what would be the optimal yk? The optimal yk, and we denote it as star here, would be from all possible subsets of uh, k points in xn, uh, choose the one, uh, the, the, the set of points that would minimize my distortion, my largest distance of each and every point from its representative. Okay. So what we are actually doing here is quantizing the set Xn by picking up uh, K candidate points, okay? And we do it not in an L2 sense, but rather in an L infinity sense in the worst case scenario. Um, so now picking up the optimal Y would obviously give us the smallest uh, error, okay? The smallest distortion, the smallest uh, representation uh, uh, error. Now, I would not prove it, but finding in the general case, uh, this uh, quantization is uh, NP, an, an NP hard problem, which means that it is a problem which is, uh, which the complexity of, the, of this problem goes up exponentially in the number of points that I'm adding to the game, which is infeasible for any practical usage if I would like to do it uh, uh, even for small numbers, I mean, 20, 30, 40, 100 points, I would uh, find it difficult to, uh, to, to do. And the question is, can we find a representation set, okay, a YK, uh, for which the quantization error would be uh, at most a constant times the optimal distortion, okay? Um, and the answer, and this is called C approximation. If I can find something like that, this is called C approximation. And the answer is obviously yes. And you, we already know what is the answer. I mean, we have an algorithm that would give me two approximation uh, uh, to this problem. And the question now is how do we prove that uh, this is indeed the case? So let let uh, so this is the algorithm and in a moment we'll prove that it is optimal so as i said before i have my endpoints so these are points assume that uh, uh these these are points and now i have to pick a point let's call this one y1 so y1 would be equal to uh, xi and now um and this is any arbitrary x uh that xi in, in my big uh, xn so the first Y would be my uh, randomly picked point XI. Now I'm looking for the point XF that belongs to XN for which uh, the distance is the furthest away from the selected points in uh, Y, which means I have to pick up the next point to be the one for which the distance from all the points that I've uh, already selected is the largest. So uh, after choosing this guy, probably this point would be Y2. Now I have one Y1 and Y2. The next point would probably be a point here. Um, if I would have had this to be uh, a continuous set of points, then the next point would uh, sit probably, not probably, obviously, on the Voronoi edge, and we already mentioned what is a Voronoi, uh, splitting the two points, uh, Y1 and Y2. Okay, now as long, and now I've chosen that point to be my next point, I'm adding it to my set Y, and if I, the size of the set Y is not equal to K, then I repeat, my loop again and again and again, and until I, I've accumulated uh, K points like that, okay? And we call this uh, set of points Y at the end of the day, K first this point something, okay? Now, what we need to prove is that, uh, and we'll do it before the, before the break, is that this, uh, um, is that this kind of uh, sampling methodology does indeed give us two approximation, okay? What I need to prove to you is that 
uh, indeed what I'm getting is a two approximation. Now, how do we do that? The trick goes as follows. Assume that some Oracle is giving to, for me the optimal selection of points. So this would have been the points. So Y in black K hat is the optimal, uh, is the optimal set of points. What I would do right now is use the pigeonhole uh, principle in order to prove that what I'm getting is a two approximation. Now, let me just give you a sketch of the proof. What I would do is draw the Voronoi diagram. Now, obviously I cannot do it in practice, but I can do it theoretically. So if somebody would have given me Y K star, I mean the optimal set of, of samples to my, uh, of my points, what I can do is I can split my space into Voronoi cells uh, for which all this, all this part would belong to this point and all that part would belong to that point. Okay. And all that part would belong to that point. I mean, each and every point here in this part of the region uh, would pick this point as its representative. And each and every point here would pick this guy as its representative. Okay, so again, what we had is my uh, set of points. And I uh, assume that I have many, 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 many points. And I have my optimal, some Oracle is giving me the optimal way of choosing representative points. And uh, with the same token, I can virtually split my space into domains for which each and every point uh, belongs to my optimal selected Ys. Okay, and now the question is how do I use this construction in order to prove uh, that my other way of picking points, my uh, not so optimal, my furthest point sampling strategy would indeed uh, be at most uh, twice as bad as the optimal one. Okay. So the sketch of the proof. Uh, first of all, we define uh, VI, VI, so this is my Voronoi cells. These are my Voronoi cells between my optimal, my optimal points. So if this is the, uh, if this is YJ, then this cell, let me, let me do it using this, then this cell would be, uh, would be, would be called uh, VJ, okay? So this is VJ. Um, so VJ includes all points in, in XN, uh, whose distance to uh, Y, I star uh, is the smallest, okay? So all the points here that belong to uh, X, uh, to capital XN uh, would, be the, uh, would be the closest to uh, Y, I star, okay? So what we can say is that if X, I belongs to VJ, then the distance of uh, X, I, sorry, of X, I, uh, to yj is smaller or equal to the distance of, uh, of um, xi to the rest of the points, to uh, the rest of the y's uh, for, all, uh, for all the points in, in uh, capital yk star, okay? Uh, in fact, we can remove the, um, the inequality here, it is actually equality because we also keep the equality here as well. Okay, so now we can use the pigeonhole principle and the proof shows that uh, either each point of the Y uh, furthest point sampling falls into different cells. So we call, we call these guys cells. So it's either uh, each point falls into a different cell, in which case uh, it is sort of trivial. 
or by some unlucky event, I have two points. So now uh, we are having our blue point. So it's either each and every point of the Y furthest point sampling is falling into a different cell or by some stroke of uh, unlucky event, I have two points falling into uh, the same cell, okay? So these are the two, uh, the two events that I have to analyze. What I will show you is that no matter what, in either cases, what we will get at the end of the day is that RK would be smaller or, equ or equal to twice uh, the maxima, the optimal distortion, okay? So, uh, the first case. Assume that each and every Y is falling into a different Voronoi cell, okay? So I have each and every um, red point. So here the, um, my Y, let's do it. Here my, just to confuse you, uh, here my Ys are uh, depicted as red, okay? So this is, these are my Y points. And you assume that each and every Y uh, point is falling into a different Voronoi cell of the, um, of the optimal, so each and every Voronoi cell of the optimal uh, split, okay? So the blacks are the, uh, the blacks are the Y optimal. And now I'm looking for the reds, which are the furthest point sampling. Okay. Now, what I know by definition is that uh, the distance, what I know is that the distance between Y and Y star um, is smaller than the optimal, than the optimal distortion, than the uh, distortion. What I know is that the distance between these two points is obviously smaller than the maximal distortion in the optimal case, okay? Why? Because each and every point was falling into its own uh, Voronoi cell. So I know that the distortion between them is, uh, is actually small, uh, smaller than the uh, worst distortion in the optimal case. So what we now, what we next do is we uh, is we uh, look for uh, is we look for what is happening for a different point x i and this point here is this red one that falls into v j okay and what we'll try to prove is that in the worst case the distance between the point and my uh, and my y k First, this point sampling point would be at most twice uh, our K star. So how do we do that? Since we deal with the metric space, uh, we can use the triangular inequality uh, to prove that for each point uh, in, X, uh, in Xi, the distance between Xi, so this, this would be Xi, let's and yj, so this is yj, is smaller than what? Is smaller than the distance between xi, let me try to do it like that, between xi and yj. So this would be the distance between uh, the yellow point that I have now completely destroyed. So let me, let me try to remove all the noise here go back into a pen and use a narrow pen. So the distance between these two points by the triangle inequality is smaller than the distance between these two points plus the distance between these two points, okay? For that, I'm using the triangle inequality. This guy is called YI. This guy is called YJ star. And this guy is called uh, the distance between xi and yj. So the distance between xi and yj is smaller than the distance between this guy and that guy. Now the, dis the distance between the, uh, uh, the representative of the cell and each, two point, and each point in the cell is nothing but rk. So this guy would be smaller than rk star and this guy would be smaller than rk 
star, and therefore I can actually uh, show that uh, the distance is smaller than twice RK star. Okay, is that clear? That part of the proof? So if by some stroke of genius, uh, I, was able, I was able to put my points in the, um, uh, in the right cells, uh, I'm done with, the, with respect to the proof that is going on here. Okay, so now let's assume that there have been some bad event. And at one point I had, at one point in my selecting of my K representative, uh, uh, representative points, two points were falling into the same, into the same Voronoi cell. So this is case two and I'm running out of time, but let's do that, okay. Assume that at, 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 there have been some event, let's call it L, uh, which is obviously smaller or equal to K of the first point sampling. So there was some event at which I had two points, YM and YL. So this would be, for example, YM, and this would be YL, where M is smaller. Assume that I've picked up this one first, and this, the event is where I picked this one to be my next one, uh, fell into the same Voronoi cell, and this would be Y, J, star. Okay, this is K star here. Okay, so uh, this was one J star. Uh, and Y, J star belongs to uh, Y capital K star. Okay. The maximal distortion of the first point strategy is obviously uh, decreasing all the time. Okay, so obviously when I picked this guy, then the distortion of RL is smaller or equal than the distortion of RM. Why? Because by construction, every time I'm picking the point for which the distortion is maximal, so I cannot do worse. So obviously this, um, uh, this condition holds. So this is true for every L which is larger than, larger than M. Remember L is the index by which I'm picking up my representative points. In fact, the closest point in, uh, uh, in L in the previous case to the newly selected YL is at a distance. So before I picked up this point, the distance, uh, the worst distortion was peaking among all points in J, uh, the closest one, okay? And uh, finding the, this is, this is the way by which my uh, L point was uh, actually selected, okay? So among all possible co points in X, I'm picking the Y uh, for which the, the distortion, the distance from I to, uh, to my, new xi is the largest, okay? And this was probably this distance, okay? This was probably this distance, okay? So this is the distance by which this point was selected. I mean, if there would have been a, a, a larger distance uh, for a closest point, uh, it, would have, uh, it would have been smaller than, the, uh, than that one, okay? Which is, which is how the first response sampling actually selects its uh, candidate because uh, if I exclude all the points that I've already selected uh, from Xn and from them I'm picking up the next point, this is the mechanism by which it is selected. So what we need to show is that if uh, the new point and the previous point both fall into Vj, then this RL by which my L point is being selected is smaller than the two times the worst distortion in the K case. If this happens, then obviously when I add more points, more, uh, L, more, uh, um, more points to my furthest point sampling strategy, uh, then obviously this condition would continue to hold because my sequence of event is so that every time I'm reducing the maximal distortion. So the claim is that when the event happened, when L, when YL landed in the same Voronoi cell, at this specific point, I already guaranteed that uh, this distortion, that the previous distortion was uh, at twice 
uh, uh, smaller than twice the optimal distortion. So how do we do that? By construction, uh, what we do is that the distortion in the previous case was smaller or equal than the distortion in the current, uh, in the current case, okay? So this is guaranteed. And therefore what we have is that the uh, selection of the K points of the kth points is obviously uh, smaller than the selection of uh, the distortion at the nth point. The nth point, which is obviously smaller than the distortion between uh, y -A -Y L and YM, which is smaller than, now we go back to the Franken inequality. Now we can show, let me remove all the noise here. What we can now do is uh, look for the distance between YL. So this is the, the distance between YL and YJ star. This is the distance between YJ star and YM. Okay, this would be this one. And obviously uh, it would be smaller I mean, each one of them, I mean, it would be smaller than twice, um, twice uh, RK star. And if you like, uh, you have here a MATLAB uh, example that would show you uh, what is going on. And it's interesting to see that if you have picked your uh, point on a regular grid at the boundary, then what you would get is something that looks like either a honeycomb or, I mean, your grid would either be regular like that or regular like uh, an optimal honeycomb, which would be the optimal way of, uh, of uh, choosing points. I mean, close to the optimal way of choosing points. Now, let me ask you the following question. Assume that you've done that and you have picked up uh, your twice as bad, uh, at most at the worst case, uh, sampling points from your set of X points. Um, how would you refine it using one of the methods that we have learned in the course? I mean, anyone has any idea? So again, let me define the question. Um, you have your domain and in your domain, you have your, uh, your points. And now I've given you, so this is your domain and you have your points. And now I've given you, I'm, I've given you uh, a way of picking up a set of K points out of this uh, set of uh, initially given points. And that, what I'm telling you is that in the worst case, uh, the distortion is smaller than, uh, than something, okay? And now the question is, can you refine this? I mean, can you somehow uh, play with this idea um, in, a, in a gradient descent fashion and improve on this on this selection of points with the max Lloyd algorithm. Yeah, you can use the max Lloyd algorithm. Uh, right. Yeah, so with the max Lloyd algorithm, although the max Lloyd algorithm is is using a different way, to, a point. This is a time in the video nine forty one. Um, so the idea is that you can. I mean, now you can put the Voronoi diagram between these, uh, between these points and shift the representative points to the point in the center uh, of, this, uh, of this set of points. Now, you need to remember, so the um, K-means or the max or the max Lloyd, you need to remember that the max Lloyd minimizes a different measure than the, the maximal distortion that is happening here. So in a least square sense, you can improve your, uh, your uh, division and conquer uh, uh, distribution of points, but you need to be careful. Uh, you, you can do something worse than that. So you need to be careful about what you're doing. But again, Max Lloyd algorithm could be used to refine this kind of uh, distribution of points. And in fact, there is uh, a paper by Laurent Cohen and um, and some, some, uh, a group of uh, French researchers who actually did it for sampling points on surfaces. Gabriel Perret and Laurent Cohen uh, did that. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting idea. So let's now take, whoa, let's now take a break.
until uh, let's do that functional maps we did. This is excellent. So now we are ready to uh, uh, do it like that. Uh, let's take 20 minute break until 11. Okay. Okay, so this is where we're getting back. Any questions about what we've done until now? Yes. Yeah. Um, in this algorithm, we assume that we chose already the K, uh, but if you want to know which K is, uh, uh, like if you want uh, to, to do grouping to the, uh, to the groups, to learn what their groups, uh, natural groups, so remember that here, uh, I use the optimal selection just as a way of proving for the two approximation of my algorithm. This is the best K clustering algorithm that you can think of. So it would not give you interpretation of the groups that you're selecting, but it would give you the best quantization, uh, practical algorithm for quantization for capital N points or for huge number of points. So again, if you're looking for interpretation of your, I mean, if, if you have a group, groups like that, then I'm not saying that it would give you uh, an interpretation for the group, but it would, uh, it would give you, I mean, what you would usually do is look at the distortion, okay? If this is RK, then you look at the distortion. The distortion would be high, then you, uh, and then there, should, there would be a jump in the distortion, okay? When this jump is happening, it means that you have picked up probably two points from the same group. So this is a nice indication of what would be the natural choice of groups in your domain. Um, so again, it would not guarantee that it would give you the optimal uh, representative from each group, but it would, if there is some distance between the groups that you're trying to, uh, to isolate and to segment, the furthest point sampling um, would give you the best uh, isolation. Again, assuming that you can measure distances in these domains and all these nice properties do happen. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, so again.
Can I ask a question about the last uh, topic? Yeah, sure. Um, can you give an example for a situation where uh, the Max Lloyd doesn't improve it? For the what? And the Max Lloyd the algorithm doesn't improve the last result. Um, yeah, sure. Of course. Look, look at the, and I will, I will give you a very, very, very simple example. Let's think of, I have, this is basically how L2 and L1, I have many, 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 many points here. Okay. I have one point here and I have many, 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 many points here. Okay. Now the max using the max Lloyd, what I end up assuming that I have that k is equal to two, for example. Um, with the with the furthest point sampling or with the optimal solution, what would happen is that I would have one point landing probably here in the middle, and one point landing here in the middle. Okay. This would be the optimal solution for the k sampling in the worst case scenario because no matter what I do, this would be my worst case. Now in the Max Lloyd, uh, what would happen is that if I have a lot of points here, they would pull this guy and place it here, probably in the middle as, the, as their number increases. Okay. So the L2, as bad as it is, is better than the L infinity in terms of, uh, of, uh, of outliers, if you, if, you th if, you, if you think of this point as an outlier. So the K, the, the, the K means or the max Lloyd is using L2. And here I was using L infinity as my way of picking up the points or way of measuring the distortion. Okay, uh, thank you. Alexander, was, was I, did I yeah. answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, so we are ready to continue. Let's do that. So now we go back into our comfort zone where we have our psi of t that is defined on a closed uh, interval, zero and one, one dimensional function, uh, only one axis. And um, we'll start asking of um, how do we exit the representation idea into processing, okay? How do we use the whole construction of a representation and use it in order to process our signals, okay? Now we call this a signal uh, that can be uh, regarded as a function. And the question is, how do we process it? So what we have seen until now is we had a function, uh, psi of t, uh, defined between zero and one, uh, between psi low and psi high. Uh, these were the values, and here the function was actually uh, behaving however it behaved. And we um, usually uh, suggested an orthogonal, orthonormal set of functions or a basis uh, in its own space that would represent this, uh, this function. And the main game was how to represent this function so that the more coefficients we add, the smaller the error would be. And when I'm talking about error, I'm talking about uh, the MSE error. And in the sense, uh, the representation uh, was nothing but uh, psi represented uh, in beta uh, is equal to psi to the coefficients of projecting basically uh, psi onto betas and the beta functions, okay? And the uh, basis that I'm using, the uh, orthonormal basis that I was using. And k belongs to either one to n or uh, minus n to n, okay? Uh, we use this notation in order to uh, represent the set of uh, integers between minus n to n. Um, what we showed is that if we define the error as the function minus its better representation, uh, then it is nothing but the energy of the function minus the energy of the coefficients, okay? Um, so this is how the error is defined. And uh, the trick that we played was choosing betas and ordering them so that the error, the uh, psi uh, MSE uh, would decay, would be decreased uh, in the most rapid way. So the final solution was probably the same, but the question was how to uh, decrease the energy in the most efficient way. So what kind of, uh, eigen, of, of functions did we use? Uh, first of all, we used the standard basis, the basis that, con that uh, consisted of these uh, functions that were one between zero and uh, delta k and zero elsewhere. So this was the first and uh, this was the first and the second was between uh, delta one and delta two, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is how my standard basis looked like. Then we talked about translating this basis into the Hadamard Walsh or Walsh Hadamard basis by some unitary matrix that uh, combine them linearly into a different, uh, in a binary way, into a different basis. Then we talked about the Haar basis, and I wave my hand in a way of uh, telling you that uh, uh, this basis is better than that one, and that one is better than that one because of something. Okay, but these were more or less heuristic claims about, uh, about these basis. Uh, then we also converted our uh, standard basis into something that we uh, called Fourier or the discrete Fourier. Um, and uh, over there we show that it, it doesn't do uh, much harm in, in keeping the, uh, what we call the narrow band function in its narrow bandness, but it did introduce some distortion when we represented the smooth function uh, using piecewise constant, uh, piecewise constant um, uh, functions, okay? Okay, um, so in addition, what we have shown is that if we, are, if we pick the Fourier coefficients, which are not piecewise constant anymore, uh, then we get our coefficients, our n to, uh, two n plus one coefficients, and this, this kind of uh, uh, basis is uh, optimal in the sense of uh, representing smooth functions. So it has a meaning, uh, it has an optimality meaning. And now what we'll do is we'll see that if we have enough properties on the operations that we would like to apply to, to, apply to our signals, 
then it makes a lot of sense of using this representation of a function um, and, and processing and dealing with the function. Now, let me tell you before I continue into my next lecture and showing you how Fourier is the best and uh, there is nothing like it. Let me tell you that you, you should take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. The fact that you can do Fourier, that you can take a signal and represent it using its Fourier coefficients in a very efficient way that you will not teach in this course, it's an analog n algorithm. Uh, so in order to project a function of n uh, candidates, of n uh, samples on, on a, a basis uh, for which each one has n uh, coefficients, in principle, you would have to invest n, Q, n squared uh, operations. But apparently, because of the multi-scale structure of the Fourier, you can do it in n log n. This was, in some sense, a revelation and, and revolution in signal processing, and everybody started to do their processing in the Fourier domain which was a mistake. It was a mistake because of various reasons. You can do uh, operations in the Fourier domain only if you restrict yourself into uh, linear operations. <coughs> and um, and uh, only if your operations have large numerical support over your domain. So you need to be really careful of when you really apply uh, the, Fourier, uh, the Fourier knowledge that you can do things. But still, it's a nice uh, way of looking at signals. This is probably the most common way that by which engineers uh, do or used to do processing, I would say, until the last decade. And uh, in order to understand what you can do beyond that, you need to understand that, OK? And in fact, at, at the end of this course, we'll teach you about uh, something which is called the Wiener filter. And the Wiener filter is an optimal filter. It would be an, a great optimal filter if uh, uh, if you restrict yourself to linear filters, okay? So obviously the moment you uh, exit this domain, you can do much more uh, and much better uh, things. Okay, so um, these were our, uh, this was our basis in the case of the Fourier. And what we did is we discussed the following uh, question of what happens when I have my Psi of T and I would like to represent a smooth version of my psi of, my psi of uh, t. And it, the, the idea was to, to take my function and to take each and every point in this function and replace it with, with an average that uh, was taking all the values between t and t plus delta, accumulating all of them and averaging them, okay? So each and every value here uh, would, would be the average of what is going on in the future, delta uh, time in the future. Uh, now there is a property which is called causality, sibatiut. And the question is whether the signal is, is causal or not. The fact that you have to look into the future in order to replace T with something that is happening in the, in the future means that this operation is not causal. It's not important, but uh, just to uh, feed you with some notations, uh, so that you would know what is a causal operation is. So if somebody is giving you a signal and smoothing it by averaging it with a, uh, within an interval which is delta apart from the current t, then you know that this is a smoothing operation and we have shown what it does to the function itself. So this was the result function and the question is uh, uh, if, for example, we know that psi is bend limited. I mean, if we know that psi belongs can be represented by 2n plus 1 numbers using the Fourier, uh, the Fourier uh, basis, what can we say about psi smooth, about the smooth version of it? And what we have seen is that the smooth version would still be, we could still represent it by these numbers, okay? The question is, can we get back the original function for, from the smooth version? So this is a pure reconstruction question. Can we get psi smooth and extract back uh, psi t, the original one? What do you think? Not entirely. Again? You lost data, so you can't uh, really do it. Let's say your, your name, please, because I can't see who is talking. Hi, Michael. Michael. So Michael is saying that you are losing data, and therefore you will not be able to reconstruct it exactly. So, Michael, you're right. This is more or less what is going on when we are, for example, taking a picture 
which is out of focus. Okay, when we have a, when we take a picture and the picture is out of focus, what happens is that each and every uh, region is being averaged uh, with its neighboring uh, pixels. Okay, and the question is, can we take um, a blurred uh, an image that is look not sharp and sharpen it? And the answer is that you can do it up to a point, but if you, for example, average numbers, getting back the original numbers could be a challenge. So you need a lot of, we call it boundary conditions or external assumptions about the data that you are looking on in order, uh, in order for, uh, for example, if I would take, I don't know, uh, seven, five, six, and then six, 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 and I would average them, then I would get, I mean, I would just get a sequence of sixes, probably six, I don't know, five plus, five point something, nine, and then six. And the question is, can we get from the six back the original? And the answer is not always. I mean, you need to, to assume something beyond what you're looking at, okay? And the question is, what can we assume is a really strong question. It's called prior. What can we say about the signal? I mean, what kind of information can we add about the signal? And how we do it is something that we will learn. Okay, so this is how uh, S smooth uh, looked like. And, um, and uh, if we assume that Psi was band limited, uh, we, we analyze the smoothness of the operator uh, of the smoothing. We call this a smoothing operator. In a moment, we'll define it properly. Um, and uh, the question is, if we look at this function in its uh, Fourier coefficients, okay, and by projecting it onto the Fourier functions, is what is the relation between the coefficients of this function and that function, okay? And if I know what is the relation, if there is a fixed relation between the coefficients of that function and that function, and if I didn't by mistake or by intention zero to any of the coefficients, then probably there is a way to invert this process and extract back the, um, uh, extract back the uh, values. Now, as we said, since this is an averaging operator, probably it would be really, really, really uh, problematic. Let me give you an intuition of why. If we look at the, if we look at the averaging operator as a way of, uh, remember that I had my Psi function and I told you that Psi smooth is basically putting uh, about each point, opening an interval of size delta and averaging over this delta, okay? It would be like traveling with a window of size delta over the signal. And for each and every point where, the, the, where this uh, signal, where this averaging window is landing, I need to take the point and, averaging, and average it with the rest of the points of the function. In a moment, we will see this, this operation is in fact, uh, it has a nice name, it's called convolution, we'll get there. Uh, but what we can, what we can say is that uh, if this guy was band limited, I mean, if the original Psi was band limited, then I can ask the question, how does the window look like from the point of view of, uh, of um, projection onto the Fourier coefficients? And it appears that if I'm looking at this kind of a function of this kind of a window function, then it's, uh, then it's uh, Fourier projecting onto the Fourier basis, I would get something that would look like a samples from a function that looks like that. Now, as long, okay, this, this, these are samples of a function that looks like that. As long as the values of these coefficients are different than zero, then I could probably do something by de-smoothing the signal. But if I have, if I have coefficients like that, that would afterwards would multiply my psi uh, coefficients, then I would have a problem. Okay, then I would have a problem because uh, once I, multi I multiply uh, uh, a coefficient by zero, I've completely lost this harmony. This harmony is gone forever. Okay, um, so we, we said that the uh, Fourier coefficient of size smooth, optimal multiplication by a constant, are the same um, as as the um, piecewise constant uh, function uh, that we, I mean, this is projecting onto the uh, piecewise constant 
um, coefficients of the uh, what we call capital for yeah. Uh, thus, storing the same constants, we can both uh, restore the psi smooth and create a piecewise uh, constant approximation of psi t. So within the piecewise constant approximations of psi t, psi smooth would give us the uh, ultimate way of uh, reconstructing back the piecewise constant uh, uh, signal. But then we have the question is, uh, what happens from a, a mean square error point of view? how size smooth it could be represented completely from uh, n plus one points would be um, uh, would look like if i'm not interested in the piecewise constant uh, functions but rather in the function itself and again i know that this function is is uh, band limited so to that end what we'll do is we'll define the sync operator uh, not operator, the sync function. This is the sync function. It's the sign divided by, uh, I mean, the sync or the, what we refer to here as dk. dk is defined as, or we call it sync, is defined as sine of x divided by x. Okay, and there are some nice property to this function. Apparently it looks like that. So you can prove that in zero it gets one, and um, which is not so trivial to prove, uh, and then it, it behaves like that. Okay, and we will also define the CIS, uh, which is the cosine plus uh, uh, the, uh, plus the complex uh, sine. Okay, what we defined as the e of i x. Was it with a minus? Probably. Um, so. What would be the MSE between Psi and Psi smooth? So this is the definition of Psi smooth. This is, the, this is uh, just writing Psi and we integrate over the square. Now, what we'll do is since we know that, that Psi is band limited, I can, write, I can write it as equality to expressing Psi using its Fourier coefficients. And uh, I can do the same for psi smooth. We already saw that it is nothing but the coefficients of psi smooth uh, times the same uh, coefficients. So I can take the two sums out of the equation and I have the, what I have here is the coefficient of psi k of the original function minus psi uh, k of the smooth function. And uh, I multiply it by uh, the right, uh, the right um, exponent, okay? Now, what I know is that these coefficients are actually no. We, we computed it in, uh, uh, in, last, in the last lecture. Okay, I know exactly how they would look like. So at the end of the day, what happens is that I have uh, these coefficients. I mean, what I'm doing here is I'm using the fact that I know that psi smooth coefficients are in fact psi Fourier times this a complex guy uh, divided by this guy. So at the end of the day, what I'm getting is that the Fourier coefficients of my, of representing my psi with the smooth functions would be nothing but uh, the Fourier coefficients of the original functions times, I mean, this is how the error would look like, the square would look like times one plus dk square. Remember dk is the sink um, uh, minus, uh, two times uh, dk cosine of uh, k uh, delta. Okay, so I have this sum over here and this over there. What, what can I say about it? Now let's explore the following. Let's ask what happens when n goes to infinity, when delta goes to zero. Uh, when delta goes to zero, we know that if we reduce the size of the smoothing uh, operator, uh, eventually I would convert to the signal itself. Let's see that I can do the math and, and in fact get to the same result. So again, writing uh, Psi and the smoothing operator, what I would do right now is approximate Psi at T at Psi as being equal to, as being equal to Psi at T. plus epsilon psi prime t 
not epsilon, this is xi, okay? Okay, and assume that xi is a small, uh, is a small um, uh, deviation from, from t. So if I plug this equation instead of this guy, you can see that I can take psi t and psi prime t out of the integration. And obviously I have here, um, I have here order of psi square or small of psi. So I can take these out of the integration. And if I do that, uh, what happens is that I have, um, I have integration so I have integration between zero and delta of one over delta, which would be nothing but uh, psi of t that would go, that would cancel with this guy. So this guy and that guy would cancel out. And what I have is that I can take this guy out of the integration and integrate over psi and integration over psi would, be, would, would do nothing but um, uh, psi squared that, so that I would get psi here in the denominator um, and at the end of the day, um, I would get psi square here uh, outside of the integration. I have integration, this guy over psi prime t plus some third order, uh, third order uh, errors, okay? So in fact, when, uh, when the uh, delta goes to zero, I would say that I would converge to the true uh, solution uh, with, uh, with this complexity, okay, with this uh, rate, with the, with the squared size of the delta. Okay, now the question that we will always ask is how can we, from these coefficients, extract these coefficients? And as I told you, just do it a little bit clearer way. So these were the coefficients with one of them of the, with one of them of the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, discrete signal. I mean, of the, this is the coefficients of the, of the, of the window. And these are the coefficients of the uh, signal itself. And the question is, can I make it uh, equal to zero somehow? And the answer is that maybe. Okay, so now let's define an operator. What is an operator? An operator uh, or a system goes like that. I define H to be my operator, uh, which operates on my input signal and the input signal is psi in of T and the output would be the output of this operator. So for each and every time t, I would have input time t, I would have an output time t, and the operator is doing something to this signal. And we already saw one, yeah? One was the smoothing operator. What we'll do is we'll design operators that would use the signals, uh, for example, images, video, voice, uh, and would uh, produce better, nicer looking images, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, here again, we'll restrict ourselves to signals between zero and one, but this should not be any limitation. Um, okay, and what we would like to do is extract back the nicer, the, to do deep blurring, sharpening, uh, restoration, reconstruction after the degradation, et cetera, et cetera. So let's make, uh, let's visit another uh, smoothing operator by shifting our smoothing window just a half uh, of delta to the left. So instead of, uh, instead of having a smoothing window that starts at t and operates until t, uh, t plus delta, what I will have now is my, uh, is my smoothing signal, smoothing operator operating about t in a symmetric manner between delta minus half and delta plus half. I did nothing, okay? And this could be a system, a filter, a operator, okay? H is defined as my operator. So the operator is defined as getting uh, psi in, operating on it with this kind of an operator, and the output would be psi out. So again, remember psi is the integrand, okay? This is the variable about which we integrate. And the output would be some psi of t. So this is again, uh, very similar to the moving average. It's a smoothing operator. And this is the one that we, that we use with the Fourier. 
what we say is that um, first of all, let's define a local operator. Okay, okay, a local map. So um, an operator is called local if if and only if um, uh, it maps each and every input at time t0 into an output of time t0, which means that if I have my function psi of t, okay, this would be t, then my local map would take each and every value here and would translate this value using its hl function, this would be psi at t0, into another function, okay? And it would always be the same system. The system would not care about uh, where the sampling of the signal came from. It would always produce the same consistent way of translating a value to a value, okay? This is one example. If L gets X, it can produce X squared, X cubed, X to the power of five. I mean, sine of X, whatever. The moment you, ha you have such an operator, this is called a local operator. Why local? Because unlike our smoothing operator, it, it was not looking ahead or it was not looking at the values before. I mean, it completely ignored uh, the region from which this, the signal was processed, okay? This is not so common, but uh, for example, let me tell you uh, about, uh, somebody knows an operator like that? Let me ask you first. Delta function? Again? Delta function? Well, delta function is a function. I'm asking, uh, you, you're using um, uh, almost every day a way of correcting uh, the way that the image in your screens look like, okay? Uh, usually- Color space get, conversion? Again? Color space conversion? So color space conversion would be one, yes. But the most simple one, if you look, even if you're looking at a, at a, a gray level image is what is called gamma correction. I don't know if you heard about it, but in order for your images to look more sharp or more uh, to, to play with the, um, with the dynamic range of the image, usually you take the image and you uh, put it as, and as, as an exponent of some value, okay? And then you get a new image, let's call it J of X, okay? And you play with this alpha. And this alpha, and this is called, uh, actually it's a gamma. And this is called gamma correction from some reason. So this is one kind of such a filter. This is another kind of such a filter. And no matter what kind of filter you're using, as long as it doesn't look at the at other values of your function, uh, then it's called local. It is interesting, uh, but again, uh, we'll work with more interesting filters. Okay. Now let's look at another kind of a filter. Let's call uh, a weight function um, W. And W could be a function of time and it could be a function of the support of this W. What W, and we'll define the operator as H that is defined by W that is operating on my signal psi in. So how does this operator works? It works like that. You take psi in, okay? So this would be psi in, and let's re replace uh, t by psi. So this would be, oh, let's write it like that. And for each and every point in psi in, what it would do is it would, so this would be w, it would put w, so for each and every time t, I would have a different w. So here I would put one w, and assume that w looks like that. Okay, and assume that here I have a different W, here I assume the W looks like that. What it would do is it would multiply each and every point of W with the point of T and would replace this value with the sum with the integration over all these multiplications, okay? So in the case of a smoothing operator, it was simple because my W function was a constant function, okay? And it was constant through all the time. I mean, it, was, it had the same shape through each and every point in time that I have chosen. It would always be integration over uh, a period of, uh, over, a, over an interval of delta. Here I'm generalized, generalizing this idea. Each and every point t, uh, I'm placing a different w about this t. 
and this W would uh, uh, sort of average the value of Psi with the corresponding values of the windows W, okay? And again, for each and every point T, I have a different W. So obviously this is not a local map because for each and every time I, I need to uh, look and uh, define a new uh, W. Um, and in fact, uh, it may also depend on the values of Psi. I mean, I can actually also uh, look at the Psi at a point and, um, and make things even, even more complicated, but let's keep it as, as is for a moment. So in any case, uh, in many cases, uh, this W uh, is called shift. Uh, let's simplify this W. So until now, each and every W like that had a different shape. So this one had a shape like that, and that one had a shape like that. And now let's simplify things. So in many cases, W is shifted version of, of some given function. So I basically uh, simplified the notion and told you that, look, for this time and for that, that time, I would have the same shape of a function. So what I'm saying is that W of Xi and T would look like H of Xi and T, okay? <clears throat> this is an important observation. It means that if I go back now into my function, so this was my function, and now my uh, eight, my W at time, sorry, my W at time T, if it had the shape like that, then my W at, time, at, a, at a different time would have exactly the same shape, okay? So I'm using exactly the same H, placing it at different places and, uh, and averaging my Psi of T with the same looking H, okay? So this would be H and this would be uh, a way of simplifying W. But if it looks the same the whole, all the time, isn't it like a constant? Again, again, like how, again. how would you, if it looks the same, like all the time, what the, the two drawings you, you now draw, yeah. if it looks the same, like how, how would it look in the middle? Wouldn't it be like constant if you're saying it's the same? What do you mean in the middle? In what middle? I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, H of T, okay? I, this is H of Xi. I'm looking at H of Xi. This is how H of Xi looks like, okay? It has this weird shape, okay? This is H of Xi uh, about zero, okay? Xi okay, Xi. I, I now understand. Okay, now I'm taking this H of Xi. Let's see if I can do that with that. And I, and I shift it, wow, this is nice. And I shift it about my T axis, okay? For each and every shift, let's say, let's say that I'm here now, I would integrate, now I had to, I have to move back here. What I would do now is in, in order to change the value of Psi of, of, uh, psi of T here, into this is in, into out, I have to integrate through all this uh, interval and multiply each and every value of H with the, with the corresponding value of Psi, okay? And then I shift it into a new location and I do the integration again. And then I shift it into a new location and I do this integration again, and again, again, again. And basically in a very smooth and continuous manner, I shift all my, uh, all my H through my T and this is how I create my new signal. Okay, let's look at very interesting signals. This is the first signal. It's called, uh, let me just enhance what is going on here. Okay, this is, it goes between minus half and one half. And the value here is one. So you can assume that um, the area of this guy is one. Okay, or um, and this is another kind of a smoothing window where it goes about T, okay? So this is another type of window where it goes about T. So these are two kind of uh, H of T's that I can consider. This, this is H of uh, Xi, and this is some other W of uh, Xi and T. 
okay, what kind of other um, properties can we can we assume? Um, let us let us just do the following. Uh, we can somehow we can sometimes reflect uh, h of xi by changing its notation, and then let's call it xi h tilde. And h tilde is equal to nothing but if this was my uh, h of xi, then this was h xi, then h of xi tilde. would be nothing but something like that. Okay, it would be a mirror, it would be a reflection of uh, H, okay? So what I can say is that H Xi, sorry, H tilde of Xi minus T is equal to H of T minus Xi, okay? This is obvious. I mean, all I need to do is just plug the inverse, uh, the minus of the argument, and this is what I would be getting. So if, for example, I restrict my window to be H of Xi minus T, then what happens is that uh, the operator um, operating on uh, psi in would be nothing but, again, writing it explicitly. Then what I do is write, uh, write um, uh, the operation of uh, operating, sorry, operating h tilde of psi minus t, psi minus t on h in, which is nothing but uh, operating with h of xi on h of t minus t, t, t minus xi, which is how it was defined to begin with. So this is important. Why? Because here um, the integration. I mean, what we do here is um, is the integration over xi comes with the positive side, and this is why we can look at h that is operating on 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 psi, while here it has a minus sign. It's a little bit more tricky to look at what the operation is doing. Now, this operation, uh, this integration over H and Psi is called convolution, okay? It is said that what we do is we convolve Psi of T, Psi of T with, with H of T, okay? And this very important operator that we denote as such, okay? This is the uh, convolution operator. And this is how it is defined, okay? So this is the convolution operator. Very important, in a moment we'll see why. Okay, next. Um, what, let, let me introduce some more operators uh, that uh, we can think of. For example, what would happen, uh, this is the shift, shift in time operator, okay? If I get a signal, and the only thing that I would be getting is um, a T shifted by uh, capital T. So if this was my, uh, if this was my signal, and then uh, at when T was equal to zero, I got minus T, but I had to start, uh, I had to start at T equal to capital T. So this is capital T. So here my new signal would start now. Okay. So this is called a shift operator or a time shift operator, okay? Uh, this operator uh, is defined uh, by the time uh, that it shifts the, uh, uh, to the right, the, uh, the data that I would have. Uh, and it can be defined as a convolution operator, okay? I can define it as a convolution operator. Somebody knows with what would be the convolution operator that I would like to apply to uh, a psi in order to get that? You have any ideas? If I have my, uh, my function psi in of t, and I would like to multiply it by some function so that integration from minus infinity to plus infinity, let's call it here psi of this h function, would be equal to phi, phi, phi i in t. Shouldn't it be a delta? Again? Shouldn't it be a delta? Yeah, yeah, Gell Mayer. Yeah. Point. It should be a delta. So the delta convolution, delta t, uh, I mean, delta t would actually do this operation. 
Now I'm telling you that what I would like to do is add here minus capital T. So what should I do with my delta? You should also shift it uh, T, yeah. like big T. So, unit. Exactly. So the trick would be to shift my delta, in a moment we'll see exactly how, by T, and then convolving my original signal with a delta which is shifted by T would in fact uh, produce this shift, time shift operator, okay? What, what is so, de delta T? Again? What is delta T? Delta T is a function, we defined it before, is a function that we denote like that. The integration of delta T between minus, and so, minus infinity and infinity is equal to one, okay? And delta T is equal to zero for every T, which is not equal to zero. And we showed that one example by which I can look at smooth, uh, not so smooth functions, uh, by which I can uh, conceptually define such a, fun such, such a delta function would go as follows. Uh, if I have uh, one over epsilon here and epsilon over two to epsilon over two here, and I take epsilon to zero, then I would get a function like that. Okay, this was my delta function. We'll get back to it in a moment and define it formally. Now, regarding to this function, if I would like to uh, this function to operate on a different function, what I need to do is shift the delta function either to the right or to the left and convolving, I mean, integrating over this delta to the right or to the left would shift the original function. Again, I promise you that we will see it. Okay, we may encounter other uh, way of uh, operating on, on a function. For example, if we add a function or if we multiply a function, um, this could be thought of as, as some sort of, uh, uh, of a, an operator over the function, okay? This, for example, happens when we look at an image through a window and then we see two images that are being added together this happens in other cases, in fact, in very similar scenarios where, you, where I have multiplication of two functions. And then usually the question is, how do I decompose them? How do I take two functions and split them into two different, uh, or multiplication? By the way, how can I conceptually convert from this kind of scenario? Assume that I solved everything for uh, adding two functions. Now, I would like to take all the three theory that I have constructed for splitting and denoising and uh, whatever you do with uh, by addition of two functions. But now somebody is giving me this scenario in which I have two, a multiplication of two functions. How do I take this, this set of problems and convert them into, these, into such set of problems? Log. What was that? Michael. Michael, so yeah. So like Michael said, log. If you take the log, then what you have here is now log of some of your psi t, which is nothing but empty from psi t plus log of empty of the uh, of this of this empty, which is another a different empty. Thank you. Okay, let's make uh, some order into the huge mess of possible operators. Um, what we would like to do is focus our, dis of our discussion of a very specific operators which are, which are both linear and shift invariant operator, okay? In a moment, we'll define exactly what they are. So if I take all possible, the space of all possible operators H, and let's put them in this, uh, in this uh, rectangle, um, so this is the space of all possible operator I can operate on, 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 a, on a signal. The operators who look the same, no matter how I shift them, are called shift invariant. The operators which are linear are, are called linear operators. And the operators that are both linear and do not, in, do not depend on the position of the signal at which I uh, place the signal are called 
linear shift invariant operators. Okay. Let's see what what do I mean by that. Let's define uh, what is a linear operator. A linear operator, as we learned in uh, our basic calculus, is such an operator that when I multiply my first signal by a constant a and my second signal by a constant b, it would be a times the operator operating on the first signal plus b times the operator operating on the second, second signal. Okay, and now let's see, for example, what is going on, for example, uh, with our... Um, um, uh, our uh, decomposition, for example, assume that I have uh, some coefficients that multiply a of t, psi of t, some, some set of functions, then immediately what I would get is that uh, if uh, is that a linear operator uh, would, I, I could push it inside uh, the summation and this is what I would be getting, okay? So this is a linear operator. Assuming H is linear. Um, so for example, if I take the, um, the convolution operator, okay, if I take um, some alpha psi that multiplies uh, psi psi of t, okay, and, and psi psi of t, I, I'm, I'm still not saying that it would be t minus psi, but let's assume for a moment that this is any uh, psi psi of t. Then, if h is linear, I can push it inside the integral and it can operate on h of, uh, of psi of t, okay? And this is uh, true for any function alpha and for any psi that, uh, that is a mapping from the same, uh, to the same uh, interval. And then psi of psi is nothing but a mapping of omega into r. So this is what I can do with linear operator. What is shift invariant operator? Shift invariant operators are operator that if I look at the shift operator that we denoted as tau t0, and uh, now I apply tau t0 uh, with a psi of t, then shift invariant operators are such that I can change the order, they commute, okay? I can change the order of uh, applying the uh, uh, operator on psi and applying the shift operator on psi, okay? So this is a shift invariant operator when it commutes with the shift operator. In other one, so, so this is the same word, so if it commutes with the shift operator. What we can say is that if I have a shift invariant operator and I have uh, psi out, which is uh, h of psi in, then shifting psi in would be nothing but shifting psi out, okay? And this would be a shift invariant operator. And this will, would obviously hold for any T0, any shift that I would uh, introduce. Okay, so we learned what is a linear operator and we learned what is a shift invariant operator. Now let's marry them. Or first of all, let's give some examples, okay? So what, what about our smoothing operator? Assume that I have my smoothing operator. The smoothing operator uh, can be thought of as a, as a um, it's, it is both, uh, let's, let's do the math, okay? So first of all, by the linearity, what we see is that if I have two functions, psi one of t and psi two of t, remember whenever I'm writing psi, it would be psi of t, okay? And I multiply them by two constants, a and b, then um, if I write, the smoothing operator explicitly, it would be a constant times psi of t plus b times psi two of t. Um, well, I write it here as psi since I integrate over psi and the interval by about which I'm integrating is t. So um, what I can do is, is basically split the integral into two. I mean, the integral is a linear operator so I can split it into two different integrals. And what I can do more than that, I can pull the constants outside, okay? So the constants A and B are outside. So in the end of the day, what we got is we got A times the operator operating on H on uh, Psi one and B times the operator operating on Psi two. So the shifting operator, the smoothing operator is linear. Okay, there is a success here. 
Now, let's see what is going on about um, the smoothing operator from a shift invariant point of view. Remember that we can uh, write the uh, smoothing operator as a convolution with the uh, with this function, okay? With a the, with a function that goes like that, okay? So if we write it explicitly, it would be nothing but psi of psi convolved with uh, this uh, window function, okay? Where the window function is equal to one uh, for each point in the interval between uh, delta divided by two, half delta, minus half delta, and plus half delta. And it would be zero elsewhere, okay? So now, if I replace psi in with the shifted version of psi in, let's see what is going on here. So what I do is I plug instead of psi, I would plug in psi minus t zero. Let's see how it would influence the result. Now what I do is change uh, the integration argument. Instead of psi, what I define is new psi, which is psi uh, minus t zero. So what I end up is having psi nu here. And here, instead of psi, I have to plug in this guy that reads like that. Okay, this is with a t here. And at the end of the day, what I'm getting is that I would get exactly the same structure as before, but be, instead of, uh, uh, instead of, um, instead of uh, psi, what I would have here is psi minus t, zero. So instead if of t at the end of the day, what I get here is t minus t zero. So what I'm getting is that the smoothing operator is also shift invariant. So the smoothing operator is both linear, plus shift invariant. And therefore we write it as linear shift invariant operator. And by the way, it wouldn't matter by which uh, window I would replace this uh, one here. I could apply the same trick. And in fact, in your homework, you'll probably be required to do so. The moment I have a function here, I can replace the argument of the function in exactly the same manner as I, sh as I showed you here. And you will have a, a shift invariant operator operator on your, on your function. What about local maps? Are local maps shift invariant? Let's check that. So again, remember that for each and every value, the local operator is operating just on this number. And if we do that by definition of linearity, uh, what happens is that uh, since I have, um, um, I, I, I just, uh, do everything locally, so the operator is obviously linear. If again, if L is linear, if the operator L is linear, then it, it would be a, a linear operator. Now, what, but what about shift invariant? Obviously, it would be shift invariant. Why? Because if I uh, now operate on psi, uh, psi in, what I can do is take this L and, and then shift it, I can replace the order of, I mean, I, they, they obviously would commute because remember that L is looking just at the number. It would not look at where the number is coming from. from. I mean, this number, that number, and that number, since they are the same, they would all be treated the same. So if I'm shifting my signal into a new location, the same operation would still operate on this number. So commuting between the, um, the, sh the, uh, the, the shift operator and the local operator would obviously give me uh, would obviously give me the same number. So it is always shift invariant, and it is linear uh, for a real scalar function. Okay, it is linear uh, by definition of linearity of real. This operator is linear if and only if L is linear. Okay, so if I'm operating on two numbers, psi one plus b psi two, L needs to be linear. If it's a non, if it's an exponent of uh, psi t, or if uh, as we did, as we had for the gamma functions, gamma correction, or if it is um, uh, x squared, I mean t squared, then I mean psi of t squared, then it's no longer linear and we'll have a problem. But if L is linear, we also know that it is shift invariant and therefore it would be a, 
a linear shift invariant operator. What about general weighting uh, functions? Okay, for general weights, uh, what we have is uh, this is how they were defined. And now we need to be careful here. Um, so similar to the smoothing operator, uh, due to the linearity of the integral, this operator is always linear. However, depending on uh, the way we construct uh, the window, it may have uh, different weights at different locations, so it shouldn't be shift invariant. However, if we restrict our windows to be such that they are defined as follows, then they would also be shift invariant. So these are shift invariant operators. Okay, so the window is is always linear, and if we also restrict it to have a shape like that, then it would be shift invariant. So putting both of them together, what I would get is linear shift invariant operator. Okay, how about the shift operator? Um, let's see what is going on with the shift operator. So we define the shift operator as the tau of capital T operating on psi in. In, in five minutes, I will, I will finish. Uh, then the operator of obviously commutes with itself. Okay, what do I mean by that? If I first of all shift by T zero and then by capital T, then this is how the output would look like. Then obviously I can uh, switch the order by which I'm subtracting this constant from my argument T. So this is it. So obviously I can write it as first of all shifting by T and then shifting by T zero. Okay, so obviously it commutes with itself. But what is also important is to show that the shift is also linear. This is important because until now we assume that it is linear just because, but let's us also prove that it is linear. So let's uh, apply the shift operator on A psi one plus B psi two. And obviously what we get is that uh, we get the, sh the shifting this linear combination is equal to shifting each and every component separately. Okay. Okay. What happens when I'm adding a constant to my functions? Would adding a constant function, so I have my psi one, I have my psi two, I add them together. So this would be psi two, this is psi one. And now I'm adding a new function. This is m of t. Would adding a new function to psi one of t and psi two of t uh, be, uh, be a linear uh, operator? And the answer is no. Why? Because if, for example, we added the same function to psi one of t and then added the same function to psi two of t, then not what I would get uh, that the linear combination of these two functions would be a plus b times m, m of t, which is not what I would have expected. I would have expected uh, a plus b to be equal to one for it to be uh, uh, to be um, uh, to be linear. So adding a constant would not be would not preserve the linearity. Another thing is that it is also not shift invariant. I mean, adding a function uh, would not keep the uh, shift invariance because for a shift invariant operator, we would have expected that the same function uh, would be added to the uh, to the original one. How would it be, be a shift invariant? I mean, for which M's would they get an equality here? Very specific constant, ones. Constant yeah. M. Yeah, constant. Thank you, Sean. So if M of T is equal to some constant, then I would have uh, equality here. Would I have linearity here if M is a constant? No. No, obviously no, because I would still have A plus B multiplying this constant. How about multiplication operators? What happens when I multiply my function by a, by a, uh, a function of t? So now I have my psi of t and uh, psi one of t and psi two of t, and I'm multiplying by uh, m of t. It appears that if I do that, uh, what I would get is indeed a linear operator. So here linearity uh, is preserved. So multiplication would preserve linearity. But the shift invariant would, would fail. Why? Because if I multiply my function uh, by a function and I shift both of them, it would not be equivalent of shifting my function and multiplying it with the same function. So it would not be shift invariant. So 
linearity holds and shift invariant breaks when I do multiplication. Uh, okay. Now the question is, um, let me just see how far can I push this lecture and I don't want to abuse it too, too much. Um, let's, let's do just the Dirac, sorry, let's just do the, uh, the Dirac function. Let, let's just do that. And remember, this is my one function. Okay, this is my one function. And um, it is normalized by one over epsilon by one over delta. And the question is what would happen when this epsilon goes to, to delta, okay? And I've already showed you that before, but let's, let's see uh, how, how would it look like. So this is a smoothing operator. Now I'm smoothing with my uh, constant window uh, function, okay? So this is my psi of psi now that is being convolved with my uh, fixed window. And the question is what happens when this window goes to, when this window goes to zero? Uh, so let me prove to you that indeed what we would get is back the original signal, which will which would obviously be, be both shift invariant and linear operator. Um, so for smooth enough functions, we can see that uh, as uh, delta goes to zero, or as uh, my big delta goes to zero, the signal would go back to its original uh, shape because if you think about it, this delta would look more and more like uh, like a delta function. Okay. So if, for example, we assume that psi is differentiable, I mean, we can take uh, the derivatives of the function, then uh, we can approximate psi about the point t as psi of t plus the first derivative of psi of t plus uh, psi minus t uh, plus some um, uh, higher order terms, uh, which is small o of delta, if you think about it, it's the higher order, uh, higher o taking delta to higher orders. So obviously when delta goes to zero, this one would go to zero. So let us plug it uh, and see how it would look like. So my out signal would look like psi of t because I'm integrating, remember how it looks like, okay? I'm plugging this guy here. Here instead of that. So I can pull my psi of t outside of the integration and the integration is equal to one. So it would be equal to one. So I get psi of t plus again, this one would not depend on psi anymore. So I can pull it out of the integration. So it would be this guy. Now let's see what is going on inside the integration. Inside the integration, I'm integrating over a function that looks like that between minus psi, minus delta and plus delta, okay? And obviously the negative area would be equivalent to the positive area. So this guy would obviously cancel out. So I'm writing zero here. So at the, at the end of the day, what we see is that it is not big surprise. We are converging to the original signal, even in this case. So in the next lecture, we'll continue and talk about other kinds of functions, um, and uh, we'll see uh, we'll see how we can actually general the whole notion of a, of a, of a convolution for more interesting functions than just the uh, just the um, uh, the delta or the fixed window uh, function. I mean, will in 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 the future what will happen is that these guys will start shaping into more interesting, uh, more interesting shapes. Questions about that? Okay, if none, then let's, uh, uh, let's meet again next week and uh, we'll continue from that point. And in the recitation, uh, Tom would go over again, uh, over the uh, functional map, so you should be able to be proficient with that. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you.